I never imagined it would come to this. The woman I pledged my life to, the one I trusted with my soul, had betrayed me. It started with small lies, late nights, and whispers in the dark. But then, the truth hit me like a freight train. Paige wasn't mine anymore. She had found someone else, someone who could give her what I apparently couldn't. My world crumbled, and in the wreckage, I was left with one burning question. How could the person I loved most become the one I feared the most? Chapter 1. A Surprising Encounter I walked back to my desk, feeling a bit unsteady. It took me a few minutes alone in my cubicle to calm my racing heart. I had managed to keep a straight face during the meeting, and I doubted anyone could tell that I was shaken. It was true, but I had learned how to hide my feelings a long time ago, and that skill helped me today. As I cleared my mind, I looked at the papers on my desk and noticed a newspaper on top. It was opened to the horoscopes, and mine was circled. This was a little joke between Cheryl, the receptionist, and me. I smiled at what it said. Wednesday will bring big changes in your family life. Accept your new situation and it will bring you happiness. Well, I thought, they got it wrong again. Only moments ago, I had received a strong criticism from my boss. It had been a loud and tense conversation, but as I reflected on it, I didn't feel angry. I was mostly puzzled. My fear had eased, but I still didn't understand why she had turned against me or where I should direct my frustration. It was so unusual for her to act this way. We had worked together for five years with her as my supervisor for the last two. She had never shown any dissatisfaction with my work. In fact, she had always supported me. I had even received two promotions and several awards, with her cheering me on through it all. In the past, I would have gone over my actions trying to find ways to earn her approval. But I had grown a lot since those early days, and Noelle was no longer just a mentor but also a good friend. Sometimes, like this morning, that made things more complicated. Not only was she unhappy, but she was also quite upset while expressing it. I had been preparing for an important meeting, and she scolded me for not double-checking the availability of a small piece of equipment. Yet, this equipment was something we didn't need, so her criticism seemed unnecessary. I could tell the flaw in her argument right away, even before I calmly pointed it out. I couldn't believe she believed what she had said. After she finished her complaints about my work, she even questioned my attitude toward the job. The whole situation made less sense the longer it dragged on. Luckily, I managed to find a way out after a long pause in our conversation. It's tough to argue with someone who doesn't respond, and my silence made it easier to leave. It felt strange to think that Noelle and I would find ourselves on opposite sides of an argument. We usually agreed on most things, and I knew we had a strong bond. She had been my guide when I started my career, and we had been friends almost from the very beginning. I saw her as a sister, and I was sure she felt the same way about me. It was the thought of putting a strain on our friendship that really unsettled me. Something was clearly bothering her, and I guessed it had nothing to do with our work or me. As soon as I realized that, I quickly walked back to her office. It was lunchtime and her door was closed, which was unusual for her. I knocked firmly and went in when I heard a sound from inside. She was sitting at her desk with her elbows resting on it and her head in her hands when I took a seat. She barely looked at me, but I saw the sadness in her eyes. Before I could say anything, she began to speak. Peter, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to say what I did. It wasn't fair to you. Then she started to cry, tears rolling down her cheeks, and she looked down, avoiding my eyes. Without thinking, I found myself kneeling next to her. I considered comforting her with a gentle touch, but held back. Instead, I whispered close to her ear. Hey, I'm okay. I could sense something was wrong from your voice. Do you want to talk about it? No, I know you want to help, but I don't feel comfortable sharing this with you. Oh, I don't mean it that way. She tried to meet my gaze when she said that. I saw her fiddling with her wedding ring. I'll be all right soon. You don't need to stay. Sam? I asked. She closed her eyes, and I understood. It might have been a special day or a memory that triggered her feelings about her late husband. I realized I was an easy person for her to express her emotions to. Please go home. I can manage here. You should take care of yourself. Do you want to ride home? Who said I was going home? 
she said with a hint of defiance and a look that tried to send me away. I wasn't in the mood for a back and forth, so I matched her tone. I did, or do you want to hear it from Sanderson? I said this jokingly, but I knew it would get to her. Sanderson was our branch manager, and she didn't want him involved in her personal matters. I noticed her expression soften a bit at the mention of his name. Is there someone I can call for you? You shouldn't be alone right now. I can leave if that's what you prefer. Noelle looked at me, surprised by my offer. Clearly, she didn't see a need for my company at her place. I can call my mother. She's home now, and I don't need you to drive me. I'll be fine on my own. She stood, signaling for me to get up too. Our offices were in downtown Philadelphia, and both her home and mine were within walking distance. Her place was just about ten minutes away. I would have happily walked her there if she had been more open to it. But I knew better than to push her when it came to her wish for privacy. I worried about my friend. She was a strong and determined person. I had learned a lot from her over the years, and the time spent together meant a lot to me. She was an excellent manager, a skilled salesperson, and a good friend. I often wondered how she managed to be so successful while keeping her distance from higher-ups. In her work, all her customers admired her honesty and fairness. She never took shortcuts to make a sale, never exaggerated what a product could do, and always kept her promises. When she was suddenly made a manager, many of our biggest clients refused to switch to other representatives. They insisted on working with her. Because of this, she was the only manager I knew who still directly handled accounts. As a manager, she was fearless. I had seen her stand up to Sanderson about customer issues more than once. That was impressive since Sanderson was a tough leader who didn't tolerate mistakes or vague answers. Most of the other managers were afraid of him, but Noel was different and that earned her his respect. She had one major struggle, her late husband. She still carried the weight of his memory with her. He had passed away five years ago, but it was only in the last year that she seemed to be starting to heal. I felt proud that I had gently encouraged her along the way during our many late-night chats. It took time to help her feel good about herself, to dress a bit nicer, and to be friendlier with her co-workers. The people who worked for her really liked her, but others sometimes found her hard to read. While she mostly wore pantsuits, there were times she would choose more feminine outfits. She started wearing a bit more makeup, smiling more, and chatting more easily with others. Although she would still grab her reading glasses quickly and wore her hair in a tight braid, I was working on helping her with those things, too. I often thought it would have been better if our desks were on the floor above where the other sales and administrative staff worked. Instead. Our offices were on a floor with classrooms, conference rooms, and executive meeting rooms. This separation seemed to feed her desire for privacy. Ironically, our jobs required a lot of public speaking, and she was very good at it. Despite her reserved nature, there were a few men upstairs who sometimes tried to show interest in her. It probably all started when she decided to wear a dress. Personally, I always thought she was beautiful, so it was a bit funny to see her turn away admirers, when she had her hair down, she looked a lot like the actress Sella Ward, but I never told her that. I didn't want to make her feel shy. Then there was a setback. Just when people at work were beginning to appreciate her kind nature, something changed. I hoped she had only shared her feelings with me and not anyone else. I should have noticed this was coming. The day before, she seemed distant during our conversation. I asked if she was all right, but she brushed me off. We talked at the end of the day, but our chat was all about work, which made me realize something was wrong. This recent event puzzled me. She had never acted this way in the five years I had known her. After she left the office, my day got worse. Noel ended up taking the next two days off, and I had to step in as the manager while she was gone. It was a tough experience that I did not want to repeat. Those days felt like they went on forever. By the end of the week, I knew that managing people was not for me. You see, I work in sales. I took a less common path to get here. I graduated from business school with a degree in accounting. I liked accounting but didn't enjoy being an accountant. So a year after that, I applied to become a systems tech for a major company. My test showed I had a talent for the tech side of things. They spent a year training me, and I loved it. Two years later, they moved me into sales, focusing on bigger, more complex deals. I discovered I also had a talent for encouraging others. I'm not exactly a cheerleader, but I can quickly understand people's strengths and help them shine. 
In turn, I get them excited about our work. On the other hand, I can often sense when someone is feeling uncertain during a sales call. I never thought those skills would make me a good salesperson, but I was wrong. So when I filled in for Noel as manager that week, I found many chances to motivate my teammates, which worked well. Most of the time, my co-workers knew how to solve their own issues. I just helped them do what they already knew. That part of the job was enjoyable, possibly because I felt ready for it and did quite well. What I didn't expect was how many meetings I had to attend and the endless requests for meetings about small matters. It became tiring to keep up with the busy schedule. I really didn't like the paperwork and was surprised at how much of it piled up in just two and a half days. Too many decisions were made by people in charge that should have been decided by the staff themselves. If you took a closer look, these problems were mostly about trust. The management just didn't trust the workers, so the system was set up to complicate things for us by flooding us with forms. Big organizations often confuse the paperwork with the real work. By late Friday, I was eager for Noel to come back. I had called her several times during those days to check in, making sure not to talk about too many work details. She seemed to sound like herself again, which made me very happy. We even shared a few laughs over minor disagreements she had with her mom. Looking back on that week, if I hadn't been so focused on work, I might have missed some of my own issues at home. Chapter 2. Another Task Ahead The following Tuesday, I was getting ready for a big meeting with some important guests, like CIOs, CFOs, or CEOs, as my dad would say, the big shots. We had an economist coming in as our guest speaker, and he was quite particular about how he wanted the room set up for his talk. I had just finished rearranging the tables in the classroom. The new setup would only allow for 20 people, but everyone would have plenty of space for their things. I smiled to myself, realizing that this part of my job was buried in that section of my job description that said, and other duties as required, something they didn't mention during my original interview. As I focused on testing the projector, my phone rang. Hello, Peter here. Is this Mr. Stewart? I recognized the voice of Tim Sullivan, our intern from last summer. I was surprised to hear from him since he had returned to school. Tim, how are you? And please, just call me Peter. What's going on? Peter, are you in the center? I need to talk to you about something important. Yes, I'm here. I'm preparing for a meeting tomorrow, so I'll be around for a while. Do you want to chat now? No, it can't be discussed over the phone. It's something I need to show you. You could send it to me. It's not like that. Hmm. Do you have time around four? I can bring it to you. I could tell he was a bit anxious. Tim usually stays calm in tough situations, which is why we invited him back for another summer. If he needed my help, I could make time. Four works for me. I'll see you then. Thanks, Peter. I know it sounds mysterious, but it really is important. No problem. Bye. I put my phone back in my pocket and noticed movement by the door. Noel walked in and looked around at the changes I had made to the room. My face must have shown something because she asked, Is everything okay? Yes, I replied, forcing a smile. I just got a call from Tim Sullivan. Tim, how is he? She asked, a smile breaking through. Noel didn't often smile at work unless she was with me or Tim. He's doing well, as far as I know. He plans to come by this afternoon. Oh, please tell him I said hi if I don't see him. I will. Noel left as quietly as she came in. She was known for being quite particular. Standing in the doorway was her way of checking on me and making sure everything was ready for our guests tomorrow. Most of my co-workers found her management style intimidating, but I didn't mind. I usually steered her focus and enjoyed our chats. The rest of the day went on as usual. A little after four, I received a message from the receptionist saying Tim was in the lobby, so I went out to meet him. Tim approached me with a tense smile. He looked a bit uneasy, but I didn't know why. Whatever brought him here felt important. Hi, Tim. What can I do for you? I asked, trying to sound as welcoming as I could. Peter, can we use one of the small meeting rooms? I need to show you something. And it's just for you, he replied. I led him to the first available room. I stepped in first, he followed, and then he closed the door behind us. He took off his backpack and sat down at the table. He pulled out a large brown envelope and handed it to me. I'm sorry for the drama, but I think you'll understand when you see this, he said softly. 
I opened the envelope and took out four large photographs. After looking through the first couple, I arranged them in front of me and studied each one carefully. I felt my focus start to fade, and I took a deep breath, feeling the air leave my lungs. The photos showed my wife with another man. They were at a bar, and it seemed like they didn't notice the camera. In the first two shots, the man had his hand around her waist, and they were leaning close together, sharing a moment. The other photos were more striking. They appeared to be engaged in an intimate exchange, clearly conveying a strong connection. When I regained my focus, I looked up at Tim, seeking answers in his eyes. He was watching me closely, and I could feel the tension. How did you get these photos, and when were they taken? I asked, surprised by my own voice. I work part-time at a restaurant near Penn's campus. A week ago Monday, I was serving a table of six, two people celebrating their engagement with some friends. They were in the main dining area by the bar, he explained. One of the girls in the group was taking lots of pictures and blocking the aisle. When I asked her to move, I saw your wife and another man in the background. I recognized her right away. I let the girl keep taking pictures but told her what was happening. I then offered her $20 to zoom in on that couple sitting at the bar. I moved out of sight while she took those photos. She sent them to me the next day. I didn't want it to be your wife. I'm really sorry. How long were they there? I asked. It looked like they were there for at least a couple of hours. They were very close to each other the whole time. I could see Tim was worried. He had met my wife, Paige, several times before. The first time was when she picked me up from work one summer day, and they spoke at his going-away dinner a month ago at Noel's house. Paige had talked a lot then, sharing news about her plans for graduate school. I looked at the pictures again, trying to understand who this man was that appeared so familiar with my wife. I didn't know him. He was dressed casually in jeans and a jacket. His shoes weren't visible. He had light hair styled in a way that suggested he used a hair salon regularly. Sitting next to Paige, he seemed larger and probably taller than her. Paige was five foot nine, so I guessed he was around six foot four. He seemed to be in his late twenties, maybe a bit younger than me. They looked completely absorbed in each other, seemingly unaware of their surroundings. It seemed they had come in alone and didn't mind being noticed. Was there something more between them? A sharp pain hit my stomach like a kick. I grimaced and pushed myself away from the table, feeling a bit dizzy. A rushing sound filled my ears. Tim noticed right away. Peter, are you okay? He asked, his voice pulling me back to reality. I wanted him to leave, knowing this was uncomfortable for him. I needed time alone to think. Yeah, I'm fine. Do you still have the email with the pictures? I asked. Of course. I didn't delete them before we met. Can you send them to me? Here's my personal email, I said, jotting it down. Oh, and before I forget, I reached into my pocket and pulled out $30. I could wait on getting my clothes from the cleaners. Here you go. I really don't want to take your money, Tim said. I, I don't feel right about this. That's not true. You need the money. It wouldn't feel right for me if you didn't take it. You paid 20 plus the printing costs. 30 should cover everything. He seemed to think better of arguing, so he accepted the cash, grabbed his bag, and headed for the door. I have to get to work. My shift starts in an hour. I nodded at him. I would have offered him a ride, but Paige had our car. Instead, I extended my hand as he approached the door. I owe you. Thank you. We shook hands, and he left while I was left alone with my thoughts and worries. Tim had said the pictures were from last Monday. I struggled to remember anything important about that week with my wife. I had been focused on work. Paige had returned home late that Monday, so we didn't talk until the morning. On Tuesday morning, she told me she had been in a study group the night before. She said it had lasted until almost midnight. She seemed tired, and I believed her. There was no reason to doubt her. She was anxious about going back to school and would study all the time if she could. I looked at the pictures again. How could she do this? When did she think it was okay to betray me? How long had this been happening? Was she going to tell me? Did she really care for this other person? I remembered that while we missed each other on Monday night, on Tuesday she came home an hour after I did. I had tutoring at the high school that night and usually got home around 9 p.m. But Paige didn't come back until after 10 p.m. And for some reason she seemed rushed when she came in the door and a bit annoyed to see me. 
Her mood changed, though, and she became very warm right before bed, which felt strange compared to how she arrived. We shared a close moment that night, and she appeared eager the moment we entered the bedroom. I claimed to be tired after we finished. If Paige was seeing someone else, she certainly hid it well. I would never have guessed anything was wrong from her behavior. The rest of last week was pretty normal. Most of the phone calls I heard her answer were from her sister Dana or her mother. There were a few other calls that seemed like sales pitches. Sure, she could have been chatting while I was out, but those chances seemed slim. I thought about what else happened that week. We went out for dinner on Friday night and visited her family on Saturday. There were no arguments or tension. We hadn't shared a deeper connection again that week, which was unusual. Our relationship had felt uncertain for over a year now. I thought it was because of the conversations we had about starting a family and Paige's anxieties about going back to school. The plans for children were on hold while Paige finished her degree. If and when we had kids, it would be a few years away. I had given up on that topic. Three years ago, I first mentioned it. And a few months later, Paige let me know she wanted to go back to school. I set aside my wish for a family. Children? What was I thinking? It seemed we weren't going to have any kids together, especially if those pictures meant what I feared. Yet maybe I was overreacting. I wasn't sure if the pictures showed a serious relationship or just a brief moment. It was only a gesture of affection. She might not have been involved with this guy for long. The pictures looked troubling, but we could perhaps move past this. I had to believe Paige would be honest with me. If I couldn't trust her, things would be very difficult. The trouble was, I didn't know what I would do if she had been unfaithful. I used to think that betrayal would mean the end of a marriage, but that was something I thought happened to other people. Now, facing the same situation left me feeling uneasy. There was another issue. I knew something about those pictures that others might not realize. My wife, while loving at times, wasn't someone who often expressed her feelings openly. She rarely engaged in public displays of affection and used to joke about it. This was just one of her quirks that I learned to accept in our marriage. Now I saw her with someone else. Was he taking advantage of her? It didn't seem like it. The more I thought about it, the angrier I got. I felt stuck. One moment I wanted to end things. The next moment, I wanted to hold on to her. I understood that having a spouse in school could be tough. Many couples face challenges when one partner is busy with school and the other does more at home. Friends had warned us about this. I expected her to be focusing 50, 60 hours a week on classes and maybe another 20 with study groups. We had talked about this, prepared for it. Paige had promised me that we would discuss any issues that came up. Since it was only the end of September, it felt too soon for us to be having problems, especially of this nature. I could talk to her about the pictures, but I didn't have anything else to prove there was another relationship. She might even find it amusing if I brought up the gesture of affection. Still, I knew I needed to discuss this with her. If I looked her in the eyes, I believed I could find out the truth. But something inside me felt like it was too early for that conversation. I wanted to know more about the situation first. It also bothered me that I hadn't realized she was unhappy with me. I felt worn out. I would have done anything for Paige and often agreed to what she wanted. It felt like throughout our marriage, I had been making one compromise after another. The last three years really showed my commitment to her. She wanted a bigger apartment, so we moved, twice. She didn't think my old Chevy was a good car for us, so we got a different one. Teaching started to bore her, so she wanted to go back to school. I agreed to support us and help pay for her studies. Then she needed a car for school, so I gave her the new car while I took the bus or walked. Her change in career was what worried me the most. I was always her biggest supporter. When she mentioned wanting to get an MBA, I encouraged her and even helped pay for her tutoring for the admission exams. I spent many evenings helping her study. Whenever she felt uncertain, I was there to cheer her on. I saved for two and a half years to have enough money for her tuition. Even then, I still made some costly purchases for the apartment that she thought we needed. As I thought about all that I had done, I realized I might have been exaggerating her role in this. I couldn't blame her entirely for how I felt. She never pressured me. She was much more delicate in expressing her wants. It was me who went along with her preferences. She was my wife, so I happily did things to make her happy. There was no clear pressure here. As her husband, I felt responsible for her happiness. 
but realizing that I might have been too eager to please made me feel even worse. Relationships are never perfectly equal. At different times, one person gives more than the other. Paige and I weren't competing. We were in a relationship, or at least I thought we were. But maybe that idea was wrong. Relationships should truly be about giving your full effort. I was doing my best, but it seemed she wasn't. Now it felt like my love for her was spoiled. I felt foolish, but it wasn't my pride that hurt. It was my heart. I ached for all the dreams I was losing because of her. Dreams that I thought she shared. Did Paige see my willingness to agree with her as a weakness? Was the way I approached our marriage part of the reason for her distance? I hoped not. If she had intended to take advantage of me, I wouldn't have known how to defend myself. I loved her. I would have acted the same way again if faced with the same choices. You have to trust those you care for. That's just how it is. I disliked the thought of losing control, but in that moment I felt very angry at both Paige and her boyfriend. I calmed myself by thinking about the aftermath. My life would be ruined if I acted on that anger. They just weren't worth it. But thinking about hurting them helped ease my pain for a moment. All I had were questions. I didn't have any clear answers. Nothing made sense considering what I knew about my wife. Those images didn't match her. My questions kept going in circles. When I finally looked up, it was 5.30 p.m., half an hour after work ended. The door opened, and Noelle came in. I barely noticed her. I left the photos spread out on the table. I should have put them away, but I wasn't thinking about hiding my issue from her. I regretted being selfish just moments later. The photos were too much for her to ignore. She stepped behind me, looking at the scenes I had been staring at. Several minutes passed in silence before I heard her take a deep breath. Come on, let's get out of here, she said firmly. My mom is cooking dinner. There's always room for one more at the table. I turned to see her face. I don't know how I looked to her, but she hesitated. I softened my expression and spoke for the first time. My voice was probably quieter than I meant it to be. I don't have any plans tonight. Your offer sounds good. With Noel leading, we left the building and went into the underground walkway that connected to downtown. A few minutes later, we were in the parking garage, and then I took a seat in her car. I don't remember much of the drive since we didn't say anything until we reached her car. You know you don't have to do this. I might not be great company tonight, I told her. Don't worry, my mom's cooking will cheer you up. If that doesn't work, she'll make sure you have a good time. So your mom comes over to cook for you? I asked, hoping to change the subject. Oh, that's right. You haven't met her yet. She's been living with me for a year and a half. I knew Noelle's mom was a widow like Noelle. It made sense that they would find comfort in each other. Really? I didn't see her at Tim's going away dinner, but I've been to your house several times in the last year and a half. I never saw her. Well, for Tim's party, she and my aunt were on a cruise that week. Thank goodness for that. I can imagine the captain remembers that trip well. You should ask her to show you the pictures. The other times, she was out. My mom usually stays away when I have friends over. I smiled at her words, but Noel looked a bit shy after sharing that. An awkward silence started to settle in. It's okay. Please don't worry about me tonight. A few minutes later, we pulled into her townhouse garage. Noel lived in the Fairmont area of the city, close to the art museum. Her house was a modern three-story townhouse with a garage and a nice balcony off the guest room. This was my fourth or fifth visit this year, and each time I felt like the style and decoration matched what I would choose. A couple of years ago, she gave me a tour of her home. It had a warm and cozy vibe, with big windows letting in plenty of light and warm colors throughout. Each room felt inviting. Being here was like leaving behind the worries of my marriage and stepping into a new world. Along with the beautiful sights, there was a delightful smell coming from the kitchen. My host excused herself and went up the stairs after showing me to the main living room. Just as I sat down on the sofa, a woman came from the back of the house. I stood up to greet her. I guessed she was in her mid-forties, definitely too young to be Noelle's mother. She was a bit shorter than Noelle, and while she was petite, she had a lovely figure. Her warm smile made it clear she was Noelle's mother. You could see where Noelle got her looks. They had the same serious eyes, and her hair had the same shiny black color as Noelle's, but that was where the similarities ended. Her mother's dress fit closely, and she walked with a confident grace, 
I thought this was a good sign for Noelle as she got older. Even though this woman was probably over 20 years older than me, I felt a strong sense of admiration. I was a bit embarrassed by this. It was unusual for me to notice a friend's mother since I had grown up. This made me more flustered as she seemed to carry herself with an effortless charm. She walked towards me with a smooth, graceful motion. Her eyes sparkled when she looked at me, and her bright smile made her look very pretty. Given my situation, I shouldn't have been focused on this, but her presence distracted me from my troubles. Mrs. DiStefano, I said, standing and reaching out my hand, but instead she pulled me into a warm hug before letting me go. I tried to play it cool, but inside I was rather surprised. Actually, my name is Ruggiero. DiStefano is Noel's married name, but please call me Muriel. Welcome to our home. You must be Peter. Her voice was as nice as her face, smooth and friendly. Yes, ma'am, I replied, raising my eyebrow, surprised that she recognized me. She seemed to catch my surprise and quickly added, Noelle told me about you helping with her adult literacy project. I also remember you from the photos she showed me from your dinner last month. You're quite a popular topic around here. By the way, are you still really ticklish? She winked after saying this. I couldn't help but laugh. Back when I was new at my job and Noelle was my mentor, we played a game where we shared something personal that few people knew. I mentioned that I was very ticklish. I was surprised that this would come up in conversation with her mother five years later. Our chat flowed easily after that, and Mrs. Ruggiero was a lovely person to talk to. Her quick jokes and laughter were contagious. Just as Noelle said, I quickly forgot my worries and got lost in her mother's stories about her trips. What a lively and cheerful woman. Her excitement felt so genuine. She made me feel like I was right there with her, enjoying the same experiences. When Noelle came back to sit next to me, I hardly noticed. So captivated was I by her mother. It wasn't until we finished dinner and her mother went to the kitchen to prepare coffee that I really noticed Noelle had changed from her business suit into a casual blouse and flowing skirt. How do you feel now? Noelle asked as we sat together again. I feel much better, thank you. You were right about your mother. She has a special way of brightening the mood. It's too bad we can't bring her to our meetings to make them more enjoyable. Noelle smiled at that, but soon her expression changed as she moved back to the topic for the evening. Peter, do you want to talk about what's bothering you? If not, that's fine. We can skip it. I felt calmer now, almost distant from the strong emotions that had overwhelmed me just a few hours ago. I do want to talk. I need to... I explained about Tim's call and how he had gotten the photos. There wasn't much to say. It seemed that my wife was being unfaithful. So you don't know this man? Noel asked. No. That's one of the many things I don't know. Honestly, until I saw those photos, I never thought Paige would do something like that. It didn't even cross my mind. The pictures look bad, Peter. We both know that. But remember, they're just pictures. They don't tell the whole story and can be misunderstood. Before you do anything you might regret, you need to talk to Paige, but only when you can do so calmly. Right now, I'm not in the mood to talk to her. I suddenly felt tired from our discussion. You'll be calm when you see her tonight, won't you? If you're even a bit unsure, maybe you should stay somewhere else. Your dad lives nearby, doesn't he? That question snapped me back to full attention. I had thought about that question. Hurting Paige was not on my mind anymore. I quickly told Noelle that. No, I need to go home. She's not in any danger from me. I would never hurt her. I just want some answers. I can't believe you asked me that. I've always seen you as calm, at least on the outside. But this situation might be hard for you, so I had to ask. When I walked in on you earlier, I had a feeling. It might be nothing. You'll get the answers you need soon enough. Noelle moved a bit in her chair and lowered her voice. What I'm going to ask now might sound odd. Just listen before you answer. What if you knew everything about their relationship, if there is one? Is there any reason that might help you understand her actions? Understand? The thought bothered me. My anger was right below the surface from when I shared the story behind the pictures. Now Noelle was bringing that feeling back. I was sure my tension showed. Yes, understand, Peter. I'm not saying you should just overlook everything. You don't know the details yet. 
I'm just saying you need to be open to understanding her if it makes sense. Otherwise, any conversation you two have won't help. I learned that too late. I wish I had been more open to forgiving my husband's mistakes. I would have listened better. Her voice softened as she spoke. I looked away, first not believing she felt that way. Then I remembered her own loss. Noelle saw forgiveness through the lens of grief. Where there was life, there was hope. Forgiveness could come. Grief ended all chances. This thinking might lead to forgiving all faults. As her friend, I didn't want to be harsh in my response, but I needed to challenge her comments. If you were in my place, could you forgive, knowing you had been let down? That's not fair, Peter. I'm not you. This is your marriage we're talking about. I just brought up whether you could think about forgiving a possible mistake, if it is just a mistake. No matter what, you need to listen with an open heart. You should seek to understand first, not to blame. I remember you told me to keep an open heart, too. Remember Kevin Connolly? Noelle was sitting closer now, and I could see a playful glint in her eyes. Oh, so that's what this is about. I guess I'll never hear the end of that. I couldn't help but smile. I thought he was a great guy. I wasn't trying to push you toward him. Really? You kept asking me to go out with him for two months. What a dull conversation. All he did was chat about his dog and his boat. Well, it was 26 feet long, he said, frowning slightly. Right, a 26-footer, a McGregor, if I recall. And to top it off, he had a way of making me uncomfortable when we were together. That caught my attention. I didn't know that, I said quietly, feeling a mix of anger and disappointment. I didn't like knowing he had crossed a boundary with my friend. I quickly searched Noelle's eyes. She was trying to give me hope in this situation. She understood my feelings but wanted to keep me calm. I appreciated her for that. Okay, I made a simple mistake by misjudging him. I should have looked into his intentions more. I get that. Could I be making the same mistake with Paige? I could forgive her, but forgiveness doesn't mean I'll forget. I will always remember what she did, just like you remember Kevin. That's not the mindset you want when you talk about that, Peter, she replied, her face now serious. I understand forgiveness, but I think we sometimes value it too much. It doesn't fix the real issues you are facing. I learned that a long time ago. You know, my life used to be great until I was eight. It was just my brother and me. He's only a year younger, and we did everything together with our parents. My dad was my hero. He was a police officer. When I was eight, my mom got very sick. She had cancer. The chances of recovery were good, but it ended her life after two years. I had to pause. Even after all this time, talking about my mom was still hard. Anyway, my dad struggled after that. He started drinking. I don't know how he kept his job, but somehow he did. His drinking got worse, and my Aunt Robin took my brother and me to live with her. She and Uncle James already had four girls, so it was crowded with our cousins. But it turned out okay. When we arrived at my aunt's, we were the youngest ones in the house. Libby, our closest cousin, was 16. Being so young and the only boys, we were spoiled with love. But it wasn't enough. We still missed our mom. And we missed our dad, too. It took three years for my father to stop drinking, three years to remember that his sons were hurting. I know it was hard for him. He came for us right after I turned 13, and then we lived with him. So I understand forgiveness. I had been looking down the whole time, but finally lifted my head to meet Noel's gaze. What I found there was kindness and another emotion that I couldn't quite name. Somehow I ended up smiling a little. This woman wasn't the problem, and I was unloading all my worries on her. She was my friend. I suddenly felt embarrassed about my thoughts. I knew her well. I couldn't picture her acting in a way that upset me, and that was part of why I was so troubled. Before I could think more, Mrs. Ruggiero entered the room with a coffee pot. We paused our chat to take care of our drinks. One sip, and I was once again impressed by her cooking. She had made real brewed coffee, not just the instant kind. Mrs. R was quickly becoming a favorite in my eyes. Mrs. Um, Muriel, this coffee is the best I've ever had, I said. Thank you, Peter. I'm glad you like it. I'll leave you two alone now. I know you have a lot to talk about, she replied. Muriel headed to the stairs. I looked at the grandfather clock and saw it was getting close to ten o'clock. It seemed she was getting ready for bed. Thanks, Peter. You just made Mom very happy. 
We don't often have guests, unless they're family. She really likes you. Brewed coffee is usually for family, you know. I meant it, and please tell her the meal was one of the best I've ever had. I don't know how you stay so fit with her cooking, I said with a chuckle. I should get going. We have an early start tomorrow, I added, standing up. Noelle stood as well and left the room for a moment. She came back with my jacket. I turned to leave. Wait, I'll give you a ride, she offered. Noelle, you don't need to do that. I'm just a few miles away. I can walk, I said. No, I'll drive, she insisted. We drove in silence. I was lost in my thoughts about what to do about Paige. By the time I looked up, we were in front of my apartment building, and I hadn't even remembered giving Noelle my address. Noelle, thank you. I go. Get some rest. I'll see you in the morning, she said. When I walked in that night, I found Paige asleep in bed. I was too restless to sleep. I sat in the dark living room and thought about the day. Maybe Noelle was right about being ready to forgive Paige. It was like her to see that possibility. It was a little funny since my wife didn't particularly care for her. I leaned back, staring at the ceiling and comparing the two women who filled so much of my life. Paige and Noelle had met many times. I noticed that although the two were polite, they never really connected. Noelle, usually reserved, tried hard to be friendly, while Paige was polite, but always seemed distant. Noelle didn't show any signs of conflict, so I didn't think anyone noticed. Paige had a way of keeping her distance without making it obvious. She always liked going to the work parties I attended. She was in her element with a crowd, charming, funny, and just a bit playful. My wife could brighten up any event. She had a talent for getting people she had just met to share their secrets. Men especially seemed to open up to her. I thought this was mainly because of her beauty. Guys were often eager to impress a pretty woman. Of course, it was all a performance. She would tease my co-workers when we got home. I didn't like what she said and told her so, but she kept it up through the years as if I hadn't said anything. However, she never made any remarks about Noelle, even though I knew she didn't like her. At first, I thought she might be a bit jealous of my friend. Paige didn't have many female friends and seemed to be wary of women in general. Later on, I figured out that Paige didn't like Noelle simply because she was Italian. The funny thing was that I'm part Italian from my mother's side. After realizing this about Noelle, I stopped mentioning my job at home. I knew Paige didn't like the extra hours I worked, so I avoided talking about my day or my co-workers. With the demands of my job, it was important to keep my work and home life separate. Looking back, the boundary my wife pushed me to create between work and family wasn't such a bad idea. Strangely, it was Noelle who often encouraged me to leave work at five so I could get home. This usually didn't work and became a joke between us. I would say I was leaving but need a few more minutes to finish a project. Hours would fly by as we chatted in her office before I finally headed home, leaving her to work late. Years ago, soon after I started working with her, we talked one evening about her husband. I had heard she was married but didn't know much about it. I knew she was a widow. By then, we had built a level of trust. She shared that they had met in college and dated for several years. Two years after they got married, he wanted to start his own auditing firm. On his very first job during an early morning review at a client's site, there was a terrible accident which took his life. This happened just before I joined the company, and knowing this helped me understand her better. We didn't talk about our families in detail very often, but that night was the anniversary of his death, and she needed someone to talk to. I stayed with her until almost midnight as she shared stories about her marriage and the husband she still missed. From what she said, he seemed like a great person, someone I would have liked to know. The fact that they never had children was especially hard for her. That conversation deeply affected me. It made me think more about how fragile life is and how important family can be. Like Noelle, I always assumed that having kids would naturally follow getting married. I thought there would be plenty of time in the future. Now, I wasn't so sure. In the third year of our marriage, I started talking to Paige about beginning a family. We were both settled in our jobs. I had saved a little money, not a lot, but enough for what we needed. We had talked about having children early in our relationship, and Paige had wanted them too. We even joked about how many kids we might have, whether four or two. Because she had some issues with birth control, we used other methods to prevent pregnancy. I stuck to this routine carefully. I thought having children was just about timing. How could I have been so mistaken? These thoughts raced through my mind as I sat in that dim room that night. 
I glanced at the wall clock and saw it was almost 2 a.m. I had been lost in thought for hours. Despite the coffee I'd had, I was mentally drained. That was the last clear thought I had before sleep took over. I suddenly felt a hand on my shoulder. I wanted to jump up, but my body wouldn't respond. I slowly realized I was being shaken. Peter, Peter, wake up. It's 7 a.m., you need to get ready. I opened my eyes and saw Paige crouching in front of me, concern on her face. I stretched instinctively, shut my eyes for a moment, and then stood up. My need to use the bathroom pulled me away. I wasn't sure if Paige was worried because I hadn't spoken. Her face faded from my mind as I splashed warm water on my face. When I returned to the bedroom, Paige was putting on her makeup. Should I have found it strange that she was doing that for a day of lectures and study groups? Did she always care about her appearance in those other classrooms when she was in charge? I couldn't remember, and that thought bothered me. Should I have noticed something, or was I just overthinking? That idea calmed me down. I remembered that Paige always put effort into her appearance no matter the occasion. It was too late to ponder that now, I thought as I unbuttoned my shirt. My moment of self-doubt was pleasantly interrupted by my curious partner. You must have had a tough night. You've never fallen asleep in the chair before. You weren't drinking, were you? Paige said with a soft laugh. Her smile disappeared when she saw my face. What's wrong, Peter? I was just joking, but that's not like you. Something's on my mind. I'll just ask you directly. Are you seeing someone else? There it was, plain and awkward. Was she talking to someone else? I wanted to ask more, but couldn't. She tilted her head slightly as if trying to see around me. For a moment, her eyes widened, but then she turned slowly away from me. Soon after, she faced me again. Her voice was steady as she replied, What? You can't be serious. My face must have told her everything. She shook her head slowly. I can't believe this, she said, getting up and walking to the window, staring outside. I just can't believe this. I've been back in school less than two months, and you come up with this? She turned to me, her face now showing anger. If she thought I'd back down, she was wrong. I stood my ground. You think I'm unfaithful? With who? A classmate? One of my teachers? Maybe it's the dean? Better yet, I'm with his assistant. How's that? I replied calmly. You were seen last week at the bar with another man, someone very friendly. Well, your source is wrong. They didn't see me, but you already know that. You know I would never do something like that. Is this about my being back in school instead of working? What is it, Peter? Do you resent supporting us while I'm not working, or are you upset about how much time I spend studying? If you have a problem, just say so. So it wasn't you? I interrupted her. Whatever Paige was doing with her makeup didn't soften the look she gave me. I felt like we were about to get into a serious argument. I decided to step back before things escalated. I got what I needed. I went into the bathroom and closed the door behind me. I took a quick shower and shave, going through the motions like a robot. When I came out, Paige was gone. I heard her in the kitchen while I got dressed, and then I heard the front door close. She left the apartment without saying another word. She wasn't honest. I guess it was naive of me to expect the truth. I might not have been ready for it, but I deserved the truth, not some excuse to make me feel guilty for asking. She wasn't honest with me. She stood across the room, looked me straight in the eye, and told a lie. That simple act hurt more than if I had seen her with someone else. It shook me deeply. Somehow, I pushed those feelings aside. I had things to do that day, other responsibilities that needed my attention. I had to focus on work. That morning, I decided to walk to the office. It was a bit rushed, but I needed the exercise. It was raining, so it wasn't the best day for a walk, but I got through it and felt better once I reached the building. The executives we invited to the meeting were all there. Our presentations went smoothly, and the audience asked great questions. We ended up with several promising leads, making the event a real success. As I walked back to my cubicle, I was surprised at how easily I had set aside thoughts of my marriage, at least for those few hours. I was good at keeping parts of my life separate. Like compartments on a ship, if one part is damaged, the others can still keep the ship afloat. My partner had deceived me. My marriage was falling apart, but I kept moving forward. This thought made me smile. People aren't like ships. Not all parts are the same. Keeping my life separate meant avoiding hard feelings and unpleasant truths. I still needed to figure out what was happening, and for that, 
I would need help. Chapter 3 Seeking help after work, I stopped by my dad's house. He still lived in the same place where I grew up in South Philadelphia. While he was still there, the neighborhood was changing fast. What was once a close-knit community was now becoming a trendy area. Everywhere around him were young families and single professionals, and somehow my dad caught their attention. He claimed he wasn't dating any of these young women, but they were often at his house. It felt like he was having a second youth. For someone with his background, I found this change surprising. As I turned the corner, I saw two young women coming down the steps from his house. They looked like students, bright and cheerful, carrying books as if they had just come from a class. I just shook my head and smiled as we passed each other on the sidewalk. One thing that stayed the same was his way of handling problems. He had been a police officer for most of his life and had risen to the rank of inspector. Now retired for five years, he still looked strong and carried himself like a cop. He had a knack for being objective about facts, and if I needed guidance, he could help me find it. I knew my father had connections all over the city. If anyone could help me with my issue, it was him. This was a new situation for us. I rarely asked my dad for help. It had been that way since I was a kid. I wanted to do things on my own, and he usually stayed out of my choices. Sometimes I thought he wanted to be more involved, but he held back. This time was different. I told him everything about finding Paige with another man. He listened quietly, nodding a little at key points in my story. When I finished, he spoke. I think you need more information, Junior, and I know just the person. Let me see the pictures. That was all he said before looking at them. A few minutes later, he started writing on a piece of paper. Here, this is someone you should talk to. He's a private investigator, the best around. I'll call him. He'll likely want to meet you. The sooner you figure this out, the better. What does your schedule look like tomorrow? I was surprised by how quickly Dad made a decision. He didn't ask how I felt or anything about Paige. Maybe I was expecting too much, but it felt strange he immediately assumed my wife of six years was out of the picture with no more discussion. Once you have started the investigation, I'll call Liz Fallon. Your wife's lawyer will probably back down once he knows she's on your side. I hadn't thought about calling Aunt Liz. She was my mother's best friend and close to Dad, too. A family court judge for 20 years, she had moved to private practice. Aunt Liz was well-known. She had written books and was an expert on child custody. She was also a tough divorce lawyer. By the way, how are you doing with money? He asked. I'm okay, I think, I replied. This was the first time I had thought about my finances. Dad smiled a bit. You think? We're talking about quite a bit of money here, Junior. Just so you know, it can be cheaper to stay together. At what cost? I replied with a hint of sarcasm. I just came over to talk to you. I only found out about all this yesterday. I'm still trying to understand it all. You've already got me separated. I felt very drained, and my voice showed it. I'm sorry, son. Some couples do get through tough times. Things may not be the same afterward, but that's how it goes. I shut my eyes for a moment. Of course, I had thought about separating from Paige since I saw the pictures, but knowing my dad shared this idea made it feel much more real. Now you are talking down to me. We both know that isn't me. He nodded. No, it's not, and I'm not trying to talk down to you. I was going to ask if you needed some money. I can handle this. But thanks for asking. You didn't mention anything about the pictures? My father answered without hesitation. What can I say? Those two seem very close in public. I hate to break it to you, but I think this is more than just a friendship. They're in a relationship. Did you see how people were looking at them? They were making quite a scene. They didn't seem to care about being noticed. By the way, did your friend say how long he watched them? He said they were there for at least a couple of hours, I replied. Dad, you seem like you expected this. I did, my father said as he got up and walked to the kitchen, leaving me to think about that last statement. I heard him make a phone call, then return a few minutes later. You're all set for Thursday morning. My face must have shown surprise. I was waiting for an explanation. Then, as if he remembered something, he added, Junior, she wasn't honest with you when you asked her where she was that night. How do you know that? You have your mom's straightforward way, so I know you asked her. If you didn't, you wouldn't have come to talk to me. He said this with some confidence. Then he offered more thoughts. 
She probably said she wasn't at the restaurant and tried to turn it back on you by saying you were being paranoid or insecure. You know, you might have caught her off guard. People often don't expect to be caught. She's hiding something. Why else would she lie? Sure, she's allowed to have a drink with a friend, but there must be more to it. I hope you didn't mention the pictures. No, I didn't. I kept quiet. Good. I didn't think you would. It's a shame, though. This may be something your marriage could survive. Just because she was seen at a restaurant doesn't mean you should consider divorce. If this wasn't about Paige, I'd say try to work it out. But your wife is tricky, so there's not much point. Huh? What do you mean by that? Nothing. Let's move on. You have other issues to think about. No, Dad. I need to know what you mean. You've never said anything like this about Paige before. Haven't I? Remember over a year ago when you told me she was going back to grad school, and I asked if you two discussed it? You said you had, and I asked how you planned to manage it, money-wise. I recall that conversation. You'd never asked about my finances before. Why does that matter? You mentioned you had some savings, and I asked if Paige was helping. You avoided my question. Later, you mentioned that she was upset about needing to take out loans, especially if they were in her name, even though you promised to handle the payments for her. Do you remember that talk? I recalled that day with my father. It felt strange to respond to his questions. It felt like he was probing too much. He shouldn't be asking about our relationship like that. Our family finances weren't something to share openly. I didn't realize then that he was trying to make a point. What surprised me was the decision you both made to move to a nicer apartment only a few months after committing to graduate school. It's a lovely place, son, but I knew it wasn't cheap. Was that Paige's idea? I just shook my head. His understanding of the situation made me uneasy, but he was right. In retrospect, I guess I look foolish. I just wish I understood why she made that choice. Don't worry too much. You may never get the answers. When I was working, I encountered many couples in tough spots. I often saw them at their worst. In my experience, men and women stray for different reasons. For women, it often comes down to three things. Money, feelings, or a desire for change. We can rule out that last one since you haven't done anything to deserve that. So, we're left with money or emotions. And I think it's likely about money. That fits with how Paige has acted in the past. My guess is this guy has a lot of financial stability. Think about it. You both planned for over two years for Paige to go back to school. You saved to make her dream possible. Knowing this, why would she risk your marriage and future for a fleeting connection? Paige is smart. She wouldn't just get caught up in fleeting emotions. No, this man likely offers her something more. I was taken aback by Dad's view. I wanted to think that Paige had a brief romance based on surface attraction. Oddly, if her decision was only about looks, I would have felt more at ease. I never thought she would deliberately betray me. My confusion must have shown on my face because he kept explaining. Junior, she hasn't invested anything in your future together. She spends all her money on appearances. You've been supporting her lifestyle throughout your marriage and she still feels entitled. Sure thing. Here's the continuation without any explicit content. Can I get you anything? Coffee? No, thank you, I replied, settling into one of the chairs. Mr. Hollis took a seat across from me. I understand you're looking for some information, he began, his tone professional. Yes, if possible. I need to know more about a situation that has come up in my personal life, I explained, keeping my focus on the task at hand. Of course. Please, share what you can and I'll do my best to assist you, he encouraged, his expression serious. I took a deep breath, recounting the details of my predicament, ensuring to provide only what was necessary. Mr. Hollis listened intently, nodding occasionally as I spoke. As we continued to discuss the situation, I felt a sense of reassurance knowing I had someone willing to help me navigate through this difficult time. It was important to me to find clarity and understanding. After some time, the conversation shifted to the logistics of the investigation. We outlined a plan to gather information, emphasizing confidentiality and mutual trust. I appreciated Mr. Hollis's straightforward approach, and it put me at ease. Thank you for your assistance today, I said as we wrapped up. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Just reach out if you think of anything else, or if you need more guidance, he replied as I stood to leave. The meeting had provided me with a clearer path forward, and as I walked out of the office I felt a sense of purpose. 
Things might not be perfect, but I was ready to face whatever lay ahead. Chapter 5 Family Ties Later that evening, I joined my dad for dinner at his place. We prepared a simple meal together, sharing laughter and stories. It was refreshing to focus on the small joys of life, especially during a tumultuous time. As we sat together eating, I couldn't help but feel grateful for his support. Our conversations flowed easily, covering everything from family history to our favorite hobbies. I found comfort in our shared memories, each one a reminder of the bond we had built over the years. After dinner, we moved to the living room where we settled into comfortable chairs. My dad mentioned a few interesting events happening in the community, and we discussed possible ways to engage and connect with others. As the evening wore on, I realized how much I valued this time with him. It felt good to have someone to lean on, and I knew that whatever challenges I faced in the future, I wouldn't have to face them alone. Tea? Water? I shook my head and waved off the offer. Okay, then. I hear you have a personal problem you'd like us to help with. I think my wife is being unfaithful. I don't have solid proof, but I need confirmation. Any information you gather will help me if I decide to get a divorce. You sound pretty certain. What makes you think that? I reached into my briefcase and took out the envelope with the pictures of Paige and her companion. I handed them to Hollis. The woman in the background is my wife. I don't know the man. These photos were taken about a week ago at a restaurant near Penn's campus. A bystander, someone at another event, took these pictures. A friend who saw my wife asked them to snap this. She seems quite at ease with this person. It's understandable that you would be concerned. Hollis sat back in his chair, shifting a bit as it seemed a little tight for him. I assume you haven't talked to her about what you found out or asked for an explanation. I did ask. She wasn't honest with me. That's not unusual. In our line of work, the truth doesn't often come from those who are being unfaithful. I gather this is your first time using a private investigator? Yes, that's right. I don't want to waste your time, Mr. Stewart, so let me be clear about what our firm does. Unlike many other companies, most of our work involves infidelity cases. However, I should mention that most of our clients have been women looking for proof against their husbands. That said, we're seeing more men coming to us lately. Regardless of the client's gender, it's important to know that what we find is lasting. We provide schedules, receipts, photos, and sometimes videos. We operate legally, but not everything we gather can be used in court. It can depend on how the information was obtained, the situation presented, the judge, and more. Once you see this evidence, you can't just forget it. We provide permanent results. That's why we have this meeting, Mr. Stewart, to prepare you. Depending on the details and where the people are located, our services usually cost between $80 to $100 per hour per person. For your case, we're looking at a flat fee of $5,000 if we choose to take it on. Often, our work leads to divorce, but I recommend considering marriage counseling as a less expensive and less stressful option. He paused for a moment, glanced at the pictures again, and then focused on my eyes. We always look for clear evidence. Most of the time, it's easy to find out what's going on, but sometimes all we get are some clues. If she's not being faithful, we'll figure it out. We're not here to spy or get involved in any revenge, and we don't want to cause any trouble either. Before we take on a case, we like to know more about our clients. Our reputation is important to us, and we want to avoid anything that might look bad. Our fee is $2,000. This was not the usual way to talk about business. It felt like I was the one being noticed. In a different place, I would have walked away by now. But there was something genuine about this man that made me want to stay. I get it, Mr. Hollis. If my wife is not being honest, I just want to move on. I'm not worried about the other person at all. I don't plan to confront him. Okay, I believe you. But be ready to talk again after we finish our work. Now, tell me about your wife. I spent the next hour sharing my story with Paige from the moment we met. I talked about her starting graduate school and the changes I noticed in her behavior lately. Speaking about it felt good in a way. I had held back some of these feelings for too long. Hollis listened closely and wrote down notes on a yellow pad. When I finished, he leaned back in his chair and asked, Are you sure you want to pursue this? I'm very sure. Let me rephrase that. 
I'm not talking about the financial aspect. Based on what you've told me, this process will likely take about three to four weeks, since the people involved are likely nearby, and we have a head start on tracking them. I'd like to set up some recording devices in your home. We just need your permission. These recordings might not be used in court, but we could find what we need without a lot of extra work. But again, I'm not just thinking about the costs. Do you really want to leave your wife? It could be a simple misunderstanding. She might already feel regret about it. Once you see our report, you may not feel forgiving. So I have to ask, do you love her? I usually don't pry, but you came to us with a unique situation. I've thought about that a lot. If I can't trust her, it doesn't matter how I feel. Love is about actions, not just feelings. What could we build together? No, betrayal is not something I can accept. I understand how you feel, but this is all so new for you. You've known about it for only a couple of days, just 42 hours. You might want to consider your options. My frown must have shown my disagreement because he then went back to our agreement. My assistant has some forms for you to fill out, and she will help set up a meeting with my colleague. I have someone ready to start this task right away. I'll check his availability before you leave. We should meet again to discuss the findings. We shook hands, and the meeting came to a close. As I walked back to my office, I felt a deep sense of regret. This was my first significant decision since I found out about her situation. It felt like entering a dark cave with no light. Paige had always been such an important part of my life. If she had indeed been with that man, our marriage might be at risk. But what would life be like without her? By the time I reached my desk, a heavy weight of sadness was settling on me. Had I acted too quickly? Maybe I should wait a few more days. I could call Hollis and tell him to pause for now. Noelle peeked her head around the corner as I was getting comfortable in my chair. Hi, Peter, she said. But her smile disappeared when she saw my face. You look really tired. I bet you haven't had your coffee yet. I tried to smile back at her, but I think she could see through it. There was no use hiding how I felt. For some reason, I wanted to protect her from the truth of this morning. You're right. I haven't had coffee. I was meeting with a private investigator. Oh, let's take a walk then. Instead of heading to the company cafeteria, we went outside. For most of the walk, Noel led the way. The streets were busy, but I found myself lost in thought, trailing behind. Today, she wore a mid-calf skirt that caught my eye. She looked confident as she walked. I felt a mixture of admiration and uncertainty. Here was my friend, and I shouldn't be thinking about her like that. Was this how I would start to see all women now? Was this going to change my outlook? We walked down the steps to the subway and soon arrived at a coffee shop at the train station. Noelle turned to me and suggested I find a table while she ordered. I noticed the sign read, The New Orleans Experience. I recognized the name. We had used their services for our events before, but I didn't know they had a cafe. It was busy inside. I took a seat at the only open table and watched her as she stood in line. I couldn't help but notice how she moved with such grace. When Noelle arrived, there was a lot of activity. I saw several people, two men and a lovely woman who came from behind the counter to greet her. The woman was truly beautiful. As I looked away, I noticed some men around me also admiring her. For some reason, I didn't like how the men with Noelle looked. One had an eye patch, and the other was a tall, slender man. Noel didn't seem worried about them at all. They exchanged hugs, and Noel's face lit up with a bright smile. My concern about the men faded, but I still felt a little uneasy. Maybe it was the attention she was getting. When they hugged, I found myself feeling annoyed, which was new for me. I had always felt proud when other men appreciated her, so this feeling surprised me. They all came over to our table and were introduced. The man with the eye patch turned out to be her cousin, the woman was his wife, and the other man was his partner. They all welcomed me warmly, and I tried to be friendly back, but inside I was still uncertain about my feelings. Today was the fourth anniversary of their shop, and they were thrilled that Noel had come to visit. I don't think they noticed my discomfort. We enjoyed coffee and several cannolis after the others returned to their work. I began to understand why the shop was so busy. The coffee and pastries were excellent. Food can really help calm nerves sometimes. The atmosphere of the place fascinated me. A couple of years ago, I had eaten at K. Paul's Louisiana Kitchen in New Orleans. 
After finishing your meal, if you cleaned your plate, the staff would put a gold star on your forehead. I remembered the feeling of being in a restaurant full of customers with gold stars, like in kindergarten. That same warm feeling washed over me as I looked around at the people at the tables nearby. Everyone seemed to be having a great time. We had been sitting there for ten minutes, and the crowd was still lively. They had figured out what makes a restaurant enjoyable. Just as I was about to share this thought with Noel, the man named Joey, who I had just met, walked over to our table. Noel, do you have a moment? She smiled and replied, Anytime, Joey, what can I do for you? He took a seat next to her. I heard you volunteer with the Literacy Project. I'm interested in joining but would like to know more before I commit. What do you want to know? Noel asked. The people you tutor, do they know how to read at all? I'm concerned that I might not have enough experience to help. Did you get any training before you started? Noel adjusted in her chair and nodded. Her eyes brightened as she spoke. This was important to her. Most of the people I've worked with knew a few words, but some did not. You learn how to handle both types of students. It's really not that hard. There's an introductory session that trains you for our role. I took it a few years ago, but Peter took it last year. He can explain it better. They both looked at me. I wasn't sure why she put me in the spotlight. Noel certainly knew more about the program than I did. I started to share my thoughts on the training. For me, it wasn't just about reading. My students struggled with counting, too, and that was a bigger challenge. But as I began to talk, I noticed Joey seemed distracted. He was looking behind me. Naturally, I turned around. Other than the people moving through the concourse, nothing seemed odd, so I turned back to him. He was ready to respond. That guy over there has been watching you two since I got to the table. Do you know him? I looked again. Which one? Nobody stands out. Down the hall, walking away on the right, a tall blonde guy in a gray jacket. I see him, I said. He was now quite a distance away. I couldn't see his face, but I recognized him from the photo. I wondered why he felt the need to watch me. Joey remained curious. Any idea who he is? Yeah, was all I said. Noelle stood up, her face showing concern. I grabbed my jacket. I hate to end this, but we should go. I'll stop by later this week and we can talk more. With that, we left. Noelle was quiet until we reached street level. Then she turned to me. This man is concerning, Peter. I don't know what he wants. Please be careful. I just nodded. That was all we said about the incident. Chapter 5. The Truth of Things At the end of the first week of November, I received my final call from Hollis. The report was ready, and we scheduled a meeting for the next morning to review the findings. During the past month, my determination hadn't wavered. Paige was home more often when I arrived, and her study group took less of her time in conversations. We spoke every evening but avoided the topic of her time spent with a fellow classmate. I knew I wouldn't bring it up. I had made my feelings clear, and it was up to Paige to demonstrate otherwise. If she believed that being more communicative about her schedule would alleviate my concerns, it wasn't working. She kept me informed, but I found that information lacking in significance. I wanted to understand more about her past. Things remained a bit awkward between us, and we hadn't been close for over five weeks. That morning, for the first time, she mentioned how distant we had become before heading off to school. In an attempt to ease the tension, I invited her to dinner that Saturday. She looked relieved at the invitation. After she left, I made my way to the offices of Hollis and Willow. Hollis greeted me again, this time with a younger man. The three of us convened in the same conference room. I noticed Hollis looked more serious than during our previous meeting. Mr. Stewart, this is Josh Claiborne, the lead investigator on your case. We have completed our work. Here's our final report, he said, handing me a folder. We regret to inform you that your wife has been involved with a classmate named Richard Lindenhall. Our team observed them together on at least nine occasions over the past three weeks. This is more than just a friendship. He paused and took out two photographs, handing them to me. I took a deep breath as I accepted them. This is unusual, but we observed your wife and Mr. Lindenhall in a private setting on one occasion, he continued. As I looked at the photos, my heart sank. I had told myself I could handle any news but seeing them together was challenging. One photo showed my wife smiling, her face close to Mr. Lindenhall's, and it felt like a punch. In the second photo, they were in a moment I didn't recognize. Mr. Lindenhall's hand was on her neck, which made me uneasy. 
Hollis and Claiborne remained silent as I processed what I was seeing. After a few moments, I finally spoke. Tell me about him, I managed to say, my voice barely a whisper. Hollis raised an eyebrow before responding. Richard Lindenhall is a first-year graduate student like your wife. He's 25, married, and has a child. His family has deep ties with Wharton. His great-great-grandfather worked closely with Joe Wharton himself. He comes from a wealthy family. His father is a senior VP at the largest brokerage in the city. Richard worked there after getting his bachelor's degree. His position requires an MBA, so his father helped him gain acceptance to Wharton. People we talk to don't think he takes his career seriously. He has mostly focused on drinking and socializing. Right now, he lives in Gladwin and has an apartment near the Penn campus. He and your wife went there a few times during the first week of our watch. How old is the child? I interrupted Mr. Hollis. He seemed a bit annoyed by my question. He was discussing Linden Hall, not his child. Claiborne answered, Two. I felt a wave of frustration. This man was married with a family. Page was making a big mistake. How would his wife react when she found out about his meetings with another woman? My eyes turned back to the photos as Hollis spoke again. Mr. Stewart, I must tell you that all our direct proof of the affair comes from the first two weeks of our investigation. They mostly met at his apartment, but they also used your apartment. However, for the last two weeks, they have not continued their meetings. In fact, from the phone recordings made in your apartment, we heard your wife clearly end their affair. Our surveillance confirms what she said. It took a moment for his words to register. I was so focused on the pictures of Paige in the library that I almost asked Hollis to repeat himself. Did he say our apartment? Paige brought this man to our place? We had only been living there since January, and I had made several friends on our floor. Was she trying to put herself at risk? Or was this Lindenhall's doing, a way of showing his presence? So Paige was done with this? Did they have a disagreement and decide to take a break? Was this really the end? Maybe if I heard them together, I could understand better. That thought led to my next question. Can I hear the last recordings you have of them together? I want to know what happened after this breakup. Of course, Mr. Stewart, we can play the last few recordings, Hollis said, nodding to his colleague. The man pressed a button on a small remote, and we suddenly heard Paige's conversations with Lindenhall. Listening to my wife and her companion felt strange, and I flinched every time she spoke. The conversations were just as Hollis had described. Each began with a call from Lindenhall, and each time she told him it was over. In the final talk, she warned him that she would tell his wife if he didn't leave her alone. Her voice was firm, her manner direct. It was like she was putting him in his place. I could hear urgency in his voice, which surprised me. In my sadness, I had pictured Lindenhall as the one in charge of the relationship. Now I wasn't so sure if Paige hadn't approached him first. He seemed almost desperate while my wife's voice stayed calm. Did I sound like this in my talks with her? Well, son, have you heard enough? We have other calls, mostly between her and her sister, but there are also a few others. The talks with her sister revealed that she was part of the deception. She worked at the same office and seemed to have helped introduce them. It's all in our report. I'm going to let Claiborne take over this meeting now. He can answer any questions. With that, his colleagues started sharing the findings. For the next hour, details about Paige's situation were revealed. At some point during the meeting, I drifted off and stopped paying attention. There were important points I would read about later in their report. Hollis was right. The images would stay with me for a long time. Why? I whispered to myself when there was a brief pause in the presentation. Excuse me? Hollis said, looking worried. Mr. Stewart, did you say something? I asked why. Why did she do this? This was more a thought than a question. I expected no answer. I glanced at Hollis. He couldn't meet my eyes and looked to Claiborne instead. I was confused until Claiborne spoke. Well, Mr. Stewart, we believe we have some insight. In talks between your wife and her sister, you were called a starter husband. It seems she intended to leave you right after finishing her studies. We think this Richard Lindenhall was who she aimed for next. Huh? It's in our report. Her sister mostly shared the details, but we don't know who came up with the plan or when it started. This was planned, I thought. I closed my eyes. It wasn't a chance meeting. I struggled to believe this. 
It made no sense. For the last two and a half years, we had worked so hard to help her get into graduate school. Why would she risk everything we built together? If I believed Hollis, then she had been misleading me all along. This Lindenhall guy was probably unaware, too. It seemed unbelievable. Could we both have been fooled? I couldn't stop thinking about it. She planned this. I took a deep breath. I never thought of my wife in such a negative light. I didn't even like that word. Now it popped into my mind without hesitation. What kind of scheme was this? What kind of person would think this was right? How could she be so indifferent? Did I mean nothing to her? Was I just a way to get what she wanted? That was it for me. The meeting was over. Hollis gave me their report, which was likely a few hundred pages long. Another copy was going to my lawyer. They also gave me a CD with the same information. I thought it might be easier to look for things that way. What was I planning to look for? Nothing specific, really. Just me being particular. When I left their office, I headed home. Noel knew about my meeting and insisted I take the day off. I had planned to go back to work, but now I understood why she was so worried. I thought I could work on our finances when I got back, but I couldn't focus on that right now. The news I received wasn't what I had hoped for. I had calmed down somewhat, but I was still shaken and trying to find a reason to doubt what I was told. Was this situation really over? Did it matter? She was involved in something else. Was that over too? The proof against her was clear, but maybe, just maybe, she made a big mistake and realized it. There was a tiny bit of hope for that. Could I forgive her if she admitted the truth? Who was I kidding? That seemed impossible. She had already lied to me and caused me to take on responsibilities for her. How long had she been planning this? Months? Years? How could I ignore that? What if I overlooked her mistake and she stayed true to me after all? What would I do then? Could I pretend nothing happened and stay married to her, keeping her secret? Could I trust her? Or would I feel uneasy for the rest of our lives? Walking around the apartment, I knew we might not last. I was close to ending our marriage, but her recent behavior made things complicated. Something didn't add up. What changed her mind? If I could figure that out, it might help me decide what to do. I felt like I was missing a key piece of information. What was Paige doing? If she stopped seeing someone weeks ago, I was not someone she seemed to turn back to. I would have felt better if she had ended things right after I confronted her. She didn't seem any more caring toward me. In fact, it seemed like she showed me more attention while she was involved with someone else. I noticed we had been talking more in the past weeks, but it felt like chatting with an old friend. Recently, she seemed anxious. When I asked her about it, she said she was nervous about a work review. Then she got a rash, which I thought was just from stress. She had a similar problem before her graduate exams over a year ago, Whatever caused Paige to end her relationship, it didn't seem related to her feelings for me. Guilt probably wasn't a factor. Maybe fear of being found out was, or fear of losing my support. But if that was true, why was she with him in the first place? That afternoon, I decided to make a list of everything we owned in the apartment. Having a detailed list with photos would be useful if we had to divide our things later. But my mind wasn't focused on that, so I decided to take a walk instead. I strolled about a mile to the Benjamin Franklin Parkway, where it stretched out towards the art museum. It was there that Sylvester Stallone filmed the iconic scene in Rocky, standing proudly at the top of the steps. It was also where I asked Paige to marry me one Saturday morning, and where we took our wedding photos several months later. If our marriage ever ended, I would think of that moment here on those steps where it all began. Under a gray November sky, I remembered how we first met. Chapter 6. How we met during my last year of college, I was known as Mr. Sirius. This nickname came from a few reasons. I was studying accounting. I spent most of my time either studying or working, and I didn't drink. Many of my classmates were busy with work and play, so my choice not to drink made it harder to socialize. I should clarify that I wasn't completely closed off. I did go on dates, but not very often. I never started any serious romantic relationships, though I did form a few strong and lasting friendships with the women I dated. I'm a good listener, which is why I often ended up as a friend. Many women like to share their problems with me. Unlike some guys who immediately try to offer solutions, I learned from living with my cousins that sometimes women just want to talk about their issues. They usually weren't looking for answers, but rather wanted someone to listen. 
so I listened carefully and only spoke up when they asked for my advice. My challenge was that by the age of 20, I had never had a romantic relationship last longer than a few months, and being labeled as just a friend didn't help me move forward. With my busy job and schoolwork, there weren't many chances to meet someone special, so I kept my eyes open for any opportunities to find that person. A week before finals, my roommate at the time, Moss Farnbach, invited me to a party in West Chester. To this day, Moss is a straightforward guy. He loves parties, but he also knows how to take responsibility. He's one of the nicest and most genuine people I met in school, which is why we ended up as roommates during my last two years. I took Moss and two of our friends to the party, knowing I would be the driver for the night, Moss's usual plan, and a good reason for me to join. I was excited to be on another campus, surrounded by new faces. The party started like many others, a crowded house, drinks flowing, a few fast dances with girls who didn't seem too interested, and no phone numbers exchanged, along with plenty of polite refusals from girls who were already with someone. A couple of hours into the evening, I was ready to sit in the car and listen to the radio until it was time to go. I was quietly moving towards the door, trying not to draw attention, when suddenly I felt someone slip their arm under mine. I turned to see a girl who was definitely the prettiest in the room. She had blonde hair and the most captivating eyes. One was blue and the other brown. They were mesmerizing. You're not leaving, are you? She asked, leaning in close. No, I was looking for you. I replied, feeling a bit awkward. My response didn't feel very clever. Those words seemed to make her happy. Do you want to dance? She asked, pulling me onto the dance floor. I followed her, trying to remember every detail about this girl. She was just a little shorter than my six feet. Her wavy blonde hair fell beautifully over her shoulders, glowing in the dim light like a halo. It created a stunning look that highlighted her unforgettable face. I couldn't help but think she looked like a model. With her stylish black outfit and long legs, I half expected the lights to flash and photographers to rush in. The music was fast and loud and our dancing felt intense. Dancing with her was different from my usual experience with girls, where we rarely made eye contact. With her, our gazes met the moment we stepped onto the dance floor. Being a decent dancer helped thanks to my cousins who taught me. After several upbeat songs, a slow, sweet melody began to play. Just like that, she pulled me close. I was surprised, but instinctively wrapped my arms around her. It felt natural, as if we had been doing this forever. The room felt warm, so when the song ended, she took me outside to the porch. A few couples were scattered around, and when my eyes adjusted to the light, she shared a warm moment with me. I struggled to keep my balance, feeling a little overwhelmed. I can hardly describe how wonderful that night was. It ended at the door to her dorm, with us holding each other warmly. Then, just like that, my friend Moss found us and pulled me back toward the car. About five miles down the road, my smile disappeared. I felt a wave of panic. In that moment, I hadn't asked for her name or given her mine. I had no way to contact her. I suddenly made a sharp turn at the next intersection. Just as we picked up speed, I heard Moss behind me. Peter, what are you doing? He asked, sounding confused. Are you okay? I can't believe I forgot to ask her name, I said, mainly to myself, but loud enough for Moss to hear. Paige Erickson? She already knows who you are. Don't worry, she'll reach out. You can count on it. I pulled over to the side of the road, surprised by what I had just heard. I turned to Moss with a sense of urgency. Moss looked taken aback. Hey, no need to worry. She'll call. She has your name and number he replied loudly, noticing my shocked expression as he let go of my collar. She's my girlfriend's roommate. She told her all about you. She was excited for you to come tonight and wanted to meet you. Got it? She wanted to meet you. I just sat there staring at him. She wanted to meet me? I couldn't believe it. I shook my head in disbelief, a big smile spreading across my face. Hey, Peter, can we go now? A voice said from the back seat. At that, my daydreaming came to an end, and we continued our drive back to campus. The whole way, I couldn't stop thinking about that amazing girl who wanted to meet me, Paige Erickson. The next morning, I decided to ask Moss more about her. He told me Paige had learned about me from his girlfriend. 
I wasn't sure what was said, but Moss thought it was probably really positive because Paige was talking about me even before I met either of them. I was amazed. Here was this wonderful girl interested in me, and I didn't know why. Moss kept telling me to stay calm. He said there was no need for me to call Paige. She would definitely reach out to me. With a few conversations, I would find out what made me special to her. Moss was puzzled about why I was getting her attention. He kept saying I was one lucky guy. If my popularity on campus was ever growing, it was now. I was overwhelmed. I couldn't focus on anything for the rest of the day. I felt like I was in a daze. Sure enough, the next night, I got a call from Paige. We talked for hours. I learned about her life. She was from Drexel Hill, and I was from Philly. She had a twin sister and two older brothers, while I had a younger brother. She was studying education, and I was studying accounting. We were both finishing our junior years. She was ending a relationship that wasn't going anywhere and wanted someone who would be there for more than a few months. I was interested in that role. It wasn't exactly a fairy tale. I still had to work, and neither of us had a car. So, on my limited free time, usually Sundays, I took the bus 25 miles to Westchester to see her. After a few visits, I think Paige started to wonder about my commitment. So, on my fourth trip, she decided it was time for us to share a deeper connection. It was a nice surprise since I hadn't pushed the topic. I won't say I hadn't thought about it. I often wondered about being closer to her since we met. I just wasn't in a rush. I really wanted to get to know her first. It was a late morning when I arrived at her apartment. Her roommate was away for the weekend. The door opened and Paige welcomed me warmly. We spent the day together. And after that, we both were on the same page about our feelings. I found myself growing more attached and our time together felt like a confirmation of that. Paige is not only very attractive, but she's also very smart. She entered college with outstanding test scores. I often thought about why she chose to study teaching and why she picked Westchester. She could have gone to any school in the country. She has a great sense of humor and is quick-witted. She's also very caring when she feels like it. She was always open to being close, but I usually had to make the first move with her. I didn't mind. Our relationship felt fulfilling, and I learned what made her happy. While she wasn't enthusiastic about certain things, she enjoyed our time together. When I was with her, I felt on top of the world. Paige knows how to make someone feel good, better than anyone I've known. These traits drew me to her, so it wasn't a shock when I proposed a few months later, and we got married shortly after graduation. However, there were some downsides. Paige wasn't always the most thoughtful. She often forgot my birthday, and even after six years of marriage, she still forgets about my peanut allergy. But those were minor issues. The bigger challenge was her view on money. Paige didn't understand the idea of my money. If I didn't keep an eye on things, she would spend without considering our bills. Understanding a budget was a new concept for her in our early years together. Even now, she reluctantly accepts that we need to prioritize our rent before indulging in things like antique auctions or theater trips. I learned this the hard way. During our time dating, I found out that Paige was quite knowledgeable about finances, which surprised me. Here was someone planning to teach small children who read financial news for fun. She had a subscription to a business magazine that she read thoroughly. I was impressed. So when we got married, she took on the task of managing our finances, which was mostly my choice. Even though I was trained as an accountant, I didn't want to handle our finances. I thought Paige would do a better job since she was very smart and seemed more worried about our money. It turned out that anyone else would have been a better choice. In just a few months, she managed to ruin our budget. We fell behind on rent and bills, and our joint checking account was overdrawn. After looking closely, I found that most of our big purchases were for her personal things or for our apartment. Her approach was to spend on things we didn't need first and then put off paying what we owed. As newlyweds trying to build our credit, we couldn't afford to be careless. This led to a big argument, and we decided I should take over the finances. This worked for about a month, until the first time Paige had to contribute to our household expenses. Then the disagreement started. She felt that my income should support the family, while her money was for her own use. I was taken aback by this belief. I tried to explain why it was important to work together on our finances. It seemed like an outdated view, and when I pointed that out, she felt a bit embarrassed and adjusted her stance. She did pay her share, but she still seemed resentful about it. 
To help ease the tension, I suggested we go out for a nice dinner twice a month at her favorite restaurants. This idea worked well. While I couldn't reach her with my reasoning, dinner dates made her happy. Paige loves being social, so having regular outings met an important need for her. She is naturally friendly and has a charming personality. Thankfully, I learned this during our time dating, and Paige had warned me about it. This part of her personality had led to breakups in some of her past relationships. Even though she was friendly, she assured me she would stay loyal. This eased my worries because she always stayed close when we went out. I noticed how she turned away a few people who approached her when I was around. In the evenings, she would share stories about the lines guys would use on her during the day and how she responded. It didn't happen every day, but it was common enough. These stories made us laugh, and Paige enjoyed telling me how people reacted when she said no. By the time we got married, her promises of loyalty and the fact that she worked with kids all day had helped ease my jealousy. So, after six years of marriage, I really believed that my wife would never betray me. Given our past, her betrayal hurt even more. But why did she do it? Was it about money, like my father thought? Did she believe she could find someone better? The idea that it was money hurt the most. It would change everything I thought I knew about her. If she was drawn to another man because of his looks or personality, that would sting too. But money felt different. I found myself questioning our whole relationship. Every little choice Paige made was now under scrutiny. I was starting to see her in a new light. Suddenly, a gust of wind surrounded me, scattering leaves in the air. Lost in thought, I hadn't noticed the temperature drop. I could no longer sit comfortably on the steps, so I headed home. I knew we needed to separate. I still wanted to check our apartment. I noticed I was still holding Hollis's report, so when I got inside, I placed it in my laptop case and began to look through our things. After about 20 minutes, I realized we hadn't gathered much in six years of marriage that could easily be sold. I finished looking at the living room and bedroom before moving on to the other rooms. Then I planned to focus on some work projects. Paige got home later in the afternoon. By then, I was in the living room typing a report. She seemed cheerful and came over to greet me. I decided to respond positively. Lately, she had been coming home earlier and her mood had been pleasant enough. If she wanted to heal things after our argument a month ago, I would act grateful for the chance to start over. It would buy me time until the separation was official. Before I could speak, she went to the bedroom and started sorting through the closet. From behind the door, she called out, Dana and Rob invited us to dinner next Tuesday at Chops in Bala. I said yes for us. That's fine, what's the reason? I asked. Rob was promoted and Dana wants to celebrate. She replied, stepping back into the room. Can you help me with this zipper? She asked. She leaned against me, and I felt her hand brush against me, surprising me. She laughed lightly at my reaction. Oh, are you ticklish? I recognized that playful tone. Months ago, I would have been happy to respond to her. Today, though, I could hardly stand the thought. No, it's not that. I think I may have hurt a couple of my ribs yesterday while playing basketball. It's hard for me to stand for a long time. Basketball? Yeah, we had a game at the high school last night. The adult literacy group is graduating next week, and some of the guys wanted to play with their tutors. I got knocked during a dunk attempt. It still hurts a little. She turned to me, her eyes soft as her hands gently held my face. That's too bad. Maybe we can play again when you're better. She smiled warmly and went back to the bedroom. I watched her walk away, noticing how gracefully she moved. She had a beautiful figure. I couldn't help but feel a bit frustrated. I regretted thinking that she could be a good mother. It was a silly thought now. Anyway, sharing my injury story would probably buy me some time. If I knew Paige, she wouldn't bring it up for at least a week. By then, it would be too late for her to worry about it. I sighed, realizing I had another event to attend. Dinner with Rob and Dana. My brother-in-law Rob could be quite full of himself, and his wife was just like him. Dana had a keen interest in appearances and seemingly enjoyed the spotlight. I also knew Paige often tried to keep up with her twin sister. While Paige went to college, Dana went directly to work after high school. Dana was intelligent like her sister, so I often wondered why she didn't continue her education. Dana married Rob a year before Paige and I did. When they wed, Rob was finishing law school, and now he was a lawyer at one of the biggest law firms around. 
He had looked set to become a partner since he got married, and he never missed a chance to remind me of his achievements whenever we were together. Dana was just a few minutes older than Paige. This made her feel she could offer advice to her little sister, which she often did, calling at least once a day. Dana and I never really connected. We mostly tolerated each other for Paige's sake. At five foot seven, Dana was shorter than Paige, but still very attractive. With her blonde hair and a charming voice, she had a way of drawing attention. Dana also had a knack for dominating conversations. When both she and Rob were around, it was hard for him to get a word in. Years ago, when I first met Rob, I thought he was friendly and easy to talk to, with a sharp sense of humor and a great memory. He had a knack for telling really funny stories that made our conversations enjoyable. Since we were both newlyweds and became family, it felt natural that we would grow closer. For the first few months after their wedding, it seemed like we were becoming good friends. Then Rob suddenly changed. He started to act more like his wife, who could be quite assertive at times. Our talks soon turned into discussions only about his job. The cheerful person I first met was gone, replaced by someone who was obsessed with his career, with Dana supporting him every step of the way. The center of their relationship appeared to revolve around Rob's job and Dana's aspirations for the future. Since Dana often talked to Paige, I found myself caught in their competitive conversations just by being with my wife. I knew I was getting a one-sided view of things, but hearing about their successes from my wife made me want to spend less time with them. Dana loved to share stories about Rob, and my wife would respond with stories about me. I sometimes felt they were keeping score of each other's spouses. Dinner usually tested my patience as the women exchanged playful banter. Rob would encourage Dana to praise him during the meal, and she would happily take over the conversation, often overshadowing her husband. I never understood why Paige put up with their antics, but she would complain bitterly when we got home. This happened every time we went out with them. My thoughts were interrupted when I heard movement down the hall. My wife came back into the room in comfy shorts and a tank top. I couldn't help but notice she didn't look like a married woman in her late twenties, more like a carefree college student. She sat down close to me, our hips and shoulders touching. How about we order takeout for dinner and watch a movie? She asked, twirling my hair with her fingers. It was clear she had a plan, totally overlooking my laptop that was open in front of us. Sure, that sounds good. We haven't done that in a while. No, we haven't, she replied with a hint of sadness in her voice. We need to make time for this. I know I do. Then she affectionately touched my neck, and when she lifted her head, our faces were really close. Before I knew it, we shared a gentle kiss. It was brief, but as I felt Paige's arm move around me, I jumped a little. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to surprise you. Let's take it easy tonight. Well, you look fantastic. Okay, let me order the food. What do you want? I'm craving shrimp with honey walnuts. I'll get Mugu Gai Pan and some egg rolls and we can share. Sounds good. Chicken for shrimp? I laughed. No, I won't share, I said, which led to some playful tickling. Before long, I was laughing and asking for it to stop. The night went on like that. We talked, ate, watched a movie, and cuddled closely on the couch. We looked like a perfect couple, both acting our parts well. I wondered if she was judging my performance as I watched hers. Later, after she was asleep, I read part of the investigator's report. My feelings got the better of me, and I cried, feeling heartbroken. I read one of the transcripts many times, hoping to find something that made it all seem less true. When I finished, the feelings I had for Paige were mostly gone. I just wanted her out of my life. What would you do if the person you trusted most shattered your world? Could you find it in yourself to forgive, or would you seek the ultimate revenge? As I grappled with these questions, the truth became clear. The answers weren't as simple as I thought. Join me in the next chapter as I navigate the tangled web of love, betrayal, and the quest for closure. Don't forget to subscribe to uncover the shocking twists that await.